Well, one day is Thursday, October 19th. How'd that happen? This is the weekend charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for attending tonight. I appreciate you taking time. Any busy schedule? I'm trying to get a, a simulcast, a simulcast working with, um, how do you say that word, <laughs> on YouTube, but so far, no luck on that. But thank you guys for attending here live. By the way, if you want to attend these shows live, davelearner.com slash webinar. So what are we talk about? Well, current market conditions, obviously, I have a lot to say about that. Your questions on trading, you can fire away now if you want on that. Hold off on your stock and crypto picks until we get to the live charts, and that'll be toward the end of this presentation. So tonight's focus, I'm going to reopen the options can of worms. I think I talked about this back in March, and then there's a, a renewed interest in options in the Facebook group, and we've been talking about them quite a bit. And it's a can of worms because they're really, really complicated. And if you understand options, you might disagree with me. And if you don't understand options, I might just confuse you. <laughs> so, but it's a mess, and we'll we'll see what we can get through it. I think uh, I think I have some really good things to say that that should help you out. And I also thought it was important to update the performance based metrics, the TFN 10% system, uh, bow ties, and Landry lights on daily, and in some cases weekly charts too. And we'll get to that in just one second. If you need to reach me, there's all my contact information, davidlander.com slash contact, if you need to contact me via email. And then there's the rest of my contact stuff. Started TikTok last week. <laughs> There's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading or as often sum it up. All predictions about the future and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. All right, let's do a performance-based update. Take a look at the S&P 500 with the both high moving averages. To those who don't know the moving averages, uh, and well, to those here who know them, it's a 10 simple, obviously, 20 exponential and 30 exponential. And when the 10 is greater than 20, 20 is greater than 30, that's uptrend proper order. Tarzan speak, good, okay? When they begin to meander back and forth, that could be a bit of a caution, and then it's bad when they cross over to the downside. You get a bow tie to the downside. In this case, it's kind of a sloppy bow tie because it took a while to go from green to red. And when that happens and then it flips back to caution where you don't have uptrend or downtrend proper order, and then let's say back to green, that's indicative of a choppy market. And of course, don't forget to draw your arrows. So like right in here, even though the moving averages have flipped back over, if you look on a net net basis, you haven't made much forward progress in two and a half, almost three months. In fact, maybe even a little bit longer. And I'll talk a little bit more about net net in just one second. Also take a look at the chart. Of course, don't just rely on an indicator. As I say, my indicators don't indicate and no indicators indicate, okay? If an indicator actually indicated where the market would be in the future, you'd own the world, but they don't. So you want to also look at the chart. I like to call indicators illustrators. They just kind of illustrate what's happening. You can see back here, lots of green. Oh, let's look at the chart. Yeah, it looks like it's going up, okay? Now, even though it's still green, notice that it did begin to roll over, so you will have some lag in some of these things. And you might want to get a little cautious long before you actually get a caution in the indicator or illustrator, as I call it. And after a while, you can start drawing your big blue arrow and notice that you have falling tops and you have kind of a head and shoulders top here. We broke down from that. We had a little throwback, which is quite common. And then now we have, which looks like a fairly bonafide rollover. And at the least on a daily chart now, we're making lower lows and lower highs. So you see, you got this all time high here. I think that was an all time high. And then you've got this high that stops short of that one and then the market rolls over correction this is not an all-time high that's just a, a big fat big picture huge picture retrace as of now at least and we'll take a look at a long-term chart in one second so looking at the landry light meaning that the lows are greater than the moving average and this just counts the number of bars that the lows are greater than the moving average for the upside for the downside it counts the number of bars that the highs are less than the moving average my favorite moving av moving average at this point in time is a 30 ema and i'm just falling more and more in love with it it's just a, it's just a great little moving average and it can really help to keep you on the right side of the market now if it's flipping back and forth between green and red green and red green and red just kind of hugging that ma line and of course again look at the net net price change where are we now where were we one month ago okay not much 
forward progress, right? Mostly sideways. So that tells you the market is choppy. And then of course you just look at the market and then we had downside Landry lights. And then now we have our first day of downside Landry light after intersecting the moving average. Remember when you intersect the moving average, the count goes back to zero. So you can see right here, count was one, two, one, two, zero, 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 negative one. You might just squint your eyes. And then once again, one, two, and then back to zero here. But again, lows graded moving average, that's a good thing. So this, again, just counts the bars. It doesn't mean that the magnitude is so, it's so far away or whatever. There's other indicators for that, reversion to the mean type stuff that I'm not a fan of, but it does help to know whether or not you're stretched one way or the other. So I'm not totally against that type of analysis. And you can see what a little red there with the highs less than the moving average. Little green here, lows greater than the moving average. And then obviously the last slide that we had before this little retrace, the highs were less than the moving average. So if we take a look at a, a weekly chart. Now remember patterns are fractal. It works in one time frame, tends to work in others. You could see that we were pretty good in here for quite some time. So it's many, 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 many weeks, about just eyeballing it, 28 weeks or so of upside Landry light where the lows were greater than the moving average. And that's a good thing. But now we're in a point where it's not a question mark, like what's the market going to do? It's a question mark to signify that it's becoming questionable in here. And you also, again, have to look at that net net price change. Okay. We're about uh, 42. I don't know. Where do we close today? I forget already. Uh, this was, this slide was grabbed about five minutes before the close. So it might be a little bit weaker than that. But let's just say 42.50 round numbers go back in time, and that's weeks. So that's many, many, many weeks ago. That was way back in June when we were last at that level. So that's not a good thing. Oh, there we go. There's the line I was looking for. And you can see you can go all the way back to last August. So on our net net price change, we haven't made any progress on a net net basis since last august so that's what august september october it's about uh a year and a couple of months now let's take a look at the tfm 10 percent system thanks to jeff who's here tonight i put these zone charts in and the TF tfm 10 percent system is based on the fact that if a market's going to drop 50%, it's going to drop 10% first. And when it drops 10%, you might want to think about getting out. And the whole TFM 10% system is a close below the 50-week moving average and a close below 10% of the 50-week closing high. So it's 50-50. I guess I could have made it 52-52, but it just start by using a 50-week moving average, 50-week closing high would make the most sense. So this line here is at 100 percent so the high that we made in 2022 that's the all-time high for the s p 500 you could see that that close there the line extended forward it makes a zone below it so that's the zero to five percent below the 50-week closing high and then this is the five percent zone anything down in this zone means that you're more than 5% away from the 50 week closing high. And Jeff pointed out many times, it's probably a good idea to get out of the way. I did some testing, a little testing on that uh, after he mentioned it. And I do find the whipsaws can be, can be pretty bad, but it's also quite useful as a tool. And that's why from now on, I'm going to use these zone charts just to give me a nice visual re representation. So as long as you're within 5% of the 50-week closing high, you're, the market's in good shape. You have to give it a little bit of wiggle room within that 5%. You don't expect the market to make new highs every day, as Greg Morris point, pointed out once. Markets only make new highs about 5%, 4% of the time. So it's not going to happen that often. In the meantime, you're back in the filling. But if you're back in the filling within 5% of a 50-week closing high, you have a pretty good healthy 
you have a pretty healthy market. Now, when you get into that 5% zone, as Jeff pointed out, things begin to get a little more questionable and you might want to start thinking about getting out of the way. And then obviously, if you drop below 10%, and if that's also below the 50-week moving average, that's just a little whipsaw filter. I've tested this without the moving averages, and I find, or moving average, the 50 simple moving average, 50 week simple moving average. But I've tested it without the moving average, and the moving average came along as a whipsaw filter. And for upside buys, you need two bars of upside Landry light, two lows greater than the 50 week moving average, and you have to be within 10% of the 50 week closing high. So anything above this red zone and two bars above the 50 week closing high is a buy any close below the 50 week moving average and into the red zone, which is 10% or more away from the 50 week closing high. You need to get out of the way, no guarantees, but this silly little system would have kept you out of every bear market in history. There will be some whipsaws here and there, the pandemic sell signal. If you were to hold through that pandemic sell signal, you actually would have ended up whole by the end of it because the market just went down 30%, I think after the signal, and then came right back. Well, it won't always come right back. And and as I've said a thousand times, a buddy of mine was visiting right around the time the market was dropping like a stone. And he wasn't getting much sleep at night because he was watching his retirement erode and he's hoping to retire in a few years. So there is some peace of mind in getting out of the way. You can always get back in. And I, I know I said this ad nauseum, but I'm gonna quote Greg Morris once again, whipsaws are frustrating, bear markets are devastating. You can survive frustration. Okay, let's reopen that option can of worms and let's see if I can get through this. <laughs> now, one thing we've been talking a lot about lately, especially since the market is questionable, and I've been showing a few shorts here and there in the trading service, is to use puts as a substitution for stock. And Everybody has an option model at their disposal as I preach. So you really don't have a, an edge there. I'm not saying to, to not, is that a double negative, use an options model, but just know that everybody has them. And, and I like seeing the implied volatility whenever I log into my trading accounts on things just to see if they're kind of out of whack. If I see an implied volatility of 60% on a zero DTE, XSP option that tells me, hang on, Dave, there's probably a Fed announcement or something you overlooked, or there's some big event coming up. So for me, that's that's a good use of an options model. But again, everybody has the same models. Uh, years ago, I do know somebody who had their own model and uh, they actually sold it. And he thinks it was a billion dollar mistake because the people who bought it stepped on the gas and immediately took the edge out of the market, but that's another story altogether. But the point is, nobody has a holy grail when it comes to a model. Way back in the day, possibly when he first came with this model, uh, people like Tony Saliba way back in the day made a lot of money because they knew what was going on. They were in the land of the blind and they had one eye. But an option models, to me, in, in my personal opinion, obviously I don't have to say that because it's me, but my uh, just keeping things simple, I wouldn't get too caught up in an option model, but rather than do that, just kind of think through it and think in terms of at expiration, okay? So for example, at expiration, if the stock is at 91 and the strike is at 90, then that put would be worthless, okay? If it's at 89 at expiration, then that put would be worth $1 because you have the right to put the stock to someone for, $90. So once you figure out at expiration, you work backwards from there. So let's say you have a week left, the stock is at 95. If you're looking at the 90 puts and they happen to be priced at $1, you got to ask yourself, can the stock 
move at least six points because you're five points out of the money. It's got to go below 90 before you make any money on it, right? Plus, it has to go one more point because you play, you paid that, that one point of premium. So in this particular case, if you look at a 95, if you look at a stock that's at 95 and it puts at 90, then by expiration, it's going to have to drop at least six points for you to break even. So you got to ask yourself about, ask yourself the, can it move far enough in the given time? As I often sort of half joke, <laughs> option trading is easy. You just have to get direction, magnitude, timing, and occasionally volatility just right. As I've said a thousand times before, I worked with a hedge fund for many, many years, 14 years, I think. And my job was to do technical analysis, not so much the option trading, but I learned a little bit through osmosis. And I'll talk about some things not to do in just one second from, from that uh, experience. But it was always frustrating for me because I'd say, okay, well, market's headed higher. Okay, well, how high is it gonna go? I was like, I don't know, I'm a trend following moron. But to me, it looks like it's headed higher. The big blue arrow is pointing higher. And then he would pressure me, you know, how far will it go? So finally, I'd have to say, you know, 10 points or whatever. Okay, can it do that? Will it do that by Friday? I'm going like, oh, geez. So you have to get so many things right. So you need to be really, really careful when you're learning how to trade options. Now, if you're going deep in the money on puts, that could be a substitution for stock. And I'll give I'll show you some examples in just one minute. I'll show like an out of the money example where you're putting up very little capital and not not a, a shit ton of margin. But the deeper you go in the money, the more it's going to behave like the underlying stock because your delta is going to approach 100. Delta is how the stock acts relative to a 100 share position in the underlying. Okay, so if something had a delta of one. Or 100 would probably be an easier way of explaining it. So let's say it had a delta of 100 for stocks because it's 100 shares. Then every point the underlying moves in your favor, you would make one point on those options. So the higher the the strike, the more the let me just explain this. Let me rewind this. The higher the strike, the less extrinsic value the option has. So uh, an option at 95 put up a put option at 95. The markets at 90 would have five points of intrinsic value. That's its actual value. Extrinsic value is anything above that that you would have to pay for the option or somebody's willing to give you for the option. So I call the extrinsic fluff. So if you're looking at a 95 option, the market's at 90, you have five points intrinsic again. And let's say it's trading at six. On the ask. So if you want to buy that option, you have to pay one dollar in fluff. And I'll walk you through a few of those examples. So let's talk about puts. Let's say the market is at 90 and the strike is at 90. So that would be at the money. The intrinsic value is zero. Okay. So if they want two dollars for that option that is 100 percent fluff or 100 percent extrinsic value now at 100 obviously you'd be 10 points in the money or 10 points extrinsic intrinsic i'm sorry let's see I told you there can of worms <laughs> so your premium would be the cost of that option let's say it's 11 minus 10 so that's how much premium or extrinsic value you're paying for that option. Now, the at the money options are gonna behave like a delta of 100 or behave like 50 shares of stock. So if the stock moves a half a point, then the option will go up 25 cents. But the further you get into money, the quicker 
that delta approaches 100, and that's known as gamma. And I'll walk you through gamma in just one second. Now, if you go deeper into in the money, the option begins to approach 100. So if you go from 90 down to 89, this option would behave like 100 shares of stock. So that option would go up one point. As you go into the money, let's say you're at the money, and as you go into the money, the extrinsic value, the fluff comes off, but your delta goes up. And hopefully that makes sense. It's not as complicated as it sounds, but trying to explain it, boy, it's, it seems kind of complicated. So let's say you have an option that's 10 points out of the money where your delta is going to be very, 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 very small. So let's say the stock goes from 90 to 89 and your option's way down here. The stock's way up here, your option's way down here, and it goes down a little bit, right? This option's only going to go up slightly in value, maybe just a, a few cents or a quarter point or whatever. It's not going to act like a an option that's deeper in the money. Now, anything below 90 is all fluff, okay? So if they want $5 for this 80 option, that's 100% premium or fluff. It has no intrinsic value whatsoever. Now, anything above 90 for a put, right, is going to have less fluff or less premium, less extrinsic value, but it's going to cost you more because it's going to be worth more on an intrinsic basis. So anything that's out of the money is cheaper from a capital outlay perspective, but it's sort of more expensive because you're paying 100% fluff. And you got to be really careful if you find those out of the money options. And once we go through a few examples, hopefully this will make a little more sense. Now, the deeper you go in the money, it's going to be more and more expensive. Okay. So maybe way down here at 80, you might be able to pick up an option for a dollar. And at 100, it's 10 points in the money. It's going to cost you $1,000. Okay. Or 10 points. Okay. So one dollar would be one hundred dollars because it's it's behaves like a hundred. It's the options pricing is based on hundred shares of stock, and at a hundred you've got ten points intrinsic, so it's going to be at least a thousand dollars. It's worth at least intrinsic, and then maybe a little bit of fluff, but not much. Now, when you're using options as a sub substitute for stock. Just ask yourself, can you can the stock move far enough by expiration to make the option working work to make buying the option worthwhile? So go to expiration, pretend you're at expiration, and then rewind from there and say, okay, I've got X amount of days and it's that far away. Will it be worth it to buy that out of the money option? And sometimes it can be. Sometimes you can buy a, an S and G type of option. Some people have a hard time paying that premium, paying that extrinsic. And they would much rather go deeper in the money. Well, that's fine, but your capital outlay is going to be bigger and bigger. I don't mind paying that market maker to take that risk because he's got to get paid too, right? If the option expires worthless, he gets paid. So I'm willing to pay up for that because he's taking a risk too. So you need to ask yourself, what's the Goldilocks situation between paying up fluff for fluff versus paying up for intrinsic. Cheaper options allow you to sleep at night, but are more likely to expire worthless. And I'll show you an S&G trade here in a few minutes that we talked about on Facebook, and that'll make a little bit more sense for like an out of the money option. More expensive in the money options cost more, so you're risking more money wise, but are more likely not to go to zero before expiration. So you'll have some value left and that option, you won't lose 100% of what you put up. Uh, but one way to look at it too though, and as I was going live, I was thinking about this, let's say you lost two points on that deep in the money option position, okay? Well, 
maybe you could have gotten a out of the money option position for one point and only lost one point instead of two. Now, obviously, you want to try to make money on all this, but you can see that's where the trade off gets a little tricky because you don't want to pay up for that premium and you're willing to go deeper in the money. You're putting more and more capital on the line. Remember what a long option, and here's the beauty of it, is you can only lose how much money you put up and it's sort of like taking your loss up front. So you got to decide what's the fluff worth to you. I might not want to spend thousands and thousands of dollars on options that are deep in the money if I can get a reasonably priced option that's closer to the money or possibly even out of the money a little bit and put up maybe $1,000 as opposed to $10,000. So it's always a trade-off. So how much is it worth to just put up a small amount of capital? Now, when it comes to out of the money versus in the money options, in the money, you're going to have more delta. It's going to behave more like the underlying. And as I'll talk a little bit about in a minute, if you're trying to mimic a position in the service, like we need a short 200 shares of XYZ, then you might want to go deep in the money because that way you could wait for a trigger to happen and that option is not going to explode in value right away. But the out of the money option, you might have to anticipate a little bit and sort of front run that setup. And I'll show you an example of what I did in just one second. So out of the money, you're going to have less delta, but that delta can increase really fast. And that real fast increase of delta, or when that delta increases really fast, the rate of change in that delta, that's known as gamma. And that can work in your favor. And sometimes you could buy a crazy out of the money option, not too crazy, but somewhat out of the money option and put in an order for two times what you paid for it for half. And I'll walk you through one in one second. And uh, the spike, a little spike alone, maybe a noise spike alone, government report or something comes out, the market goes kind of nuts. You could end up with a free position on that. Unfortunately, if you're maybe deep in the money, you might have a gain, a big gain initially, but it might not be enough to take profits, and then you watch that gain erode. And so you see how tricky it gets and how quickly it's in. And a lot of people just have problems wrapping their head around it, and they have that problem, they have problems paying up for premium. And an example, kind of a core, uh, a correlated example would be I put a stock in my service. We got one in now that that had a 29% stop. Well, I don't know anybody personally this time, but I know in the past that people were like, Dave, Dave, I can't put, I can't risk 30% of position. Well, you're adjusting your share size down to where you're still, you're still only risking $2,000 per 100K or 2% of your account. And if you do it a trading, obviously much less. But people get kind of caught up in the fact that it's so far away percentage wise. Well, if it moves, 15, 20, 25% in a day, you're going to have to be outside of that normal noise. And the same thing goes with options. I don't mind, again, paying up a little premium here and there. And it's a trade off. And it's like if, if those options that are at the money are slightly out of the money or, or even a little further out of the money are just super, super expensive, then I'll just keep going in further and further up. So, okay, I'm five points in the money. So now I've got to put up at least $500 for those options. Plus, what's the fluff? Two points fluff. Okay. Am I willing to pay two points fluff? Let's say it's seven for those options. Well, I don't know. Maybe I'll go a couple of more strikes up to where I'm paying one point fluff. And then I have that go to locks kind of trade off. So with the in the money options, again, if you're deep in the money, you could trade them more like the underlying stock. Now, let's say you've got a, a stock that's $100 a share. If you were to short that stock, 100 shares, you would have to put up $10,000, but you might be able to buy a deep in the money option for $1,000, okay? So you could trade a little bit more like you would the underlying. You could wait for an entry. So if I'm saying get in at 99 and it hits 99, then you can go and buy a deep in the money option. Now, with out of the money options, you have to anticipate things a little bit more. And if you were to sit around and wait for that trigger, 
then that option could skyrocket in value so fast that it's no longer a bargain to buy. So it's a little bit tougher with the out of the money options. And you got to be careful with those because it seems like a bargain. But a lot of times they're not. They'll, they'll end up expiring worthless. Now, we were talking options in the Facebook group. And I was being asked about a, a setup PWR that I had in my Landry list. And I think shorter term, it was a, it was a decent looking setup. But longer term, and that's where the real money is, it just had some supply along the way. And um, Awesome asked me to look at those three stocks and show me what, show him what I liked about them. We'll get to that in one second. But that's the only thing I didn't like about that stock was that it just seemed to have a little support all the way down. Now, if you're going to do some S&G trading, you can buy a short dated out of the money option with a small capital outlay. And like I said in the Facebook group, when I bought two of these options for $25, that's 50 bucks plus a little commission, not much. But let's just say $50 round numbers. I said, well, on Friday when they expire, if I lose all of my 50 bucks, then we're going to have pizza instead of fillets on Friday night. So you can kind of sweep it under the rug, but there's a problem with that. And we'll get to that in just one second. Now, when you do buy something like an out of the money option, like in this case, you want to immediately put an order to sell half at 2X. So again, I when I did this example, I told everybody, don't follow me, but I just want to show you using 50 bucks, what could happen and how you play this. So you can see I put in a limit order for one to close at 50. So I put down 50 bucks, okay? And I made 50 bucks, so where am I now? Well, I'm at zero, but I still have one option. I have a free ride on that second option, which expires tomorrow. So we'll see how this little um, s and trade worked out. Now, it does give you a, a chip in a chair. Okay, it's a, that's a poker analogy to where if you have one chip, you could sit at the table and you could bet your one chip and that might work. And then you then you have a few more chips and you can keep that in that one chip or several chips or whatever. So in a case like the PWR, I'm like, well, this stock looks like it could roll over. And for 50 bucks, I could establish a 200 share position, which would probably be about what you would trade actually a little bit less on a 100k account so 50 bucks i've got a chance i'll be at a small one over the next several days when i put this on when i put that on on the 17th so 17th 18th 19th 20th so in four days four days for 50 dollars i am effectively short 200 shares of this stock Provided, of course, it begins to crash. Now, in an iffy environment like this, and you've got a stock that looks like it could be a little trouble, eh, it might be worth putting up 50 bucks just to kind of get a position in for four days and then make a decision on whether or not you want to take a longer term position or not, or a longer term option position. So here's the PWR trade. It was in a downtrend and I'll pull up in a minute for um, Austin, and I hope I'm hope, hope I'm saying your name right. Um, it's either Asim or Austin or Awesome. <laughs> Let me know. Anyway, you can see we it was a pretty serious downtrend. It was also a bow tie, and I was looking at the 180 puts because I was making a point about out of the money option. And this is where I bought the two puts for 25 cents. And remember, that's it's based on 100 shares of the underlying. If you were in futures, then it would be a little bit more confusing because it'd be based on the futures contract. But in a case like stocks, it's 100 shares. OK, so 25 is $25. And again, I had a whopping $50 invested in this educational type of trade 
And fortunately, it did sell off. And as you saw in a second ago, I was able to cash out of half of those for 50 bucks. And I don't remember where it closed, but I know right before the close, it was a, a buck or two in the money. So those options are worth a couple hundred bucks, maybe a little less. Just as big bid ask can be a problem on many of the stocks you pick as they or more inefficient stocks. Yes. That's especially true on the upside. On the downside, I tend to short stocks that are a little bit more efficient. So I hear you. But what you could do with those bid asks is you don't hit the ask in options. Like if I want to be short a stock, I just get short. Okay. I want to get long a stock, I just get long. Okay. And a lot of cases, like if it's a service stock or something, I'll put a stop entry order at the entry and go about my life. And if I get a zing, then I know I got triggered in. Options are a little more complex. I always use a limit order to get in and a limit order to get out. So Jeff, you're right. You could have a big old spread, but what you do is just kind of just kind of go try to get in, maybe put in an order just a little bit above that bid. And sometimes you'll be shocked. Sometimes you'll get it. And then just keep kind of, bumping it up a little bit. Now, the only problem with doing that, it seems like anytime I try to do it, all of a sudden they start bumping the option price on me, which makes you feel like they're looking at you or something. But anyway, you can see this is the, we've gotten to this long conversation on Facebook. So you see right here, okay, just for rest of G's, I just bought two 170 Friday options for $25, $50 was 20. So the point I was trying to make was, I'm not telling you to rush out and buy out of the money options. I'm just telling you that it's something you can kind of look at if you want to get a position, especially if it's short or dated. And in this particular case, I, I really didn't want a long, uh, longer dated position here because it has a lot of support down the pike or below the market. But I thought it'd be a, it'd be fun and also something to show you guys for like a like a short dated type of of option where that gamma could really explode and the Delta skyrockets. So I would encourage you guys to go through these threads. And uh, luckily, we have a new guy in the group that knows a little bit about spreading, and I'm looking forward to learning from him. I'm gonna mention that in just one second too. Now, if you're doing that S&G option trading, it, it can be dangerous, but it does have its place. So 50 bucks, as, as the example I used, you can establish a short position that would have required a $37,000 capital outlay, okay? So it's like 17 and a half or whatever the stock was at the time. If you want to short it, you're gonna to have to put up $37,000 worth of capital or you can put up 50 bucks, okay? But you only get four days, it's out the money. Chances of expired worth is pretty darn good. But if you kind of felt like, I really want to short this stock, these options are going to expire in a few days, let me just kind of test the waters, let me just get a little position going here, and then by Friday, I'll decide whether or not I want to hang on to it longer term. So again, it gives you a chip in the chair. Now, you got to be careful, though, because you can't get a little bit pregnant. If you start throwing around 50 bucks here, 100 bucks there, and you start doing that over and over, it's gonna add up after a while, okay? And it's important that you occasionally hit on these things. But I'm just showing you some ideas on how possibly you can, you can play options. So this Elf Beauty was a short in my trading service. So again, 10 was greater than 20, 20 is greater than 30. That's good, right? And then the moving averages began to meander. And then they went back to good. Well, even though they're back to good, always take a look at the net-net price movement. And you can see we have a bit of a double top working. Now, I was asked why I picked this particular stock and also the KBH. And then I didn't make PWR official. Well, what I liked about the CLF was you kind of had this double top in here. I don't trade off a bigger picture technical analysis, but I do pay attention to it, that and the net net price movement and such. 
And you can see we switched over quickly from uptrend proper water to downtrend proper water to make that bow tie pattern. And all that's needed to complete the pattern is a one bar higher high and higher low, ideally. Sometimes we'll just trade off a higher high if that's more complex conversation. But for all intents and purposes, if you're new to trading bow ties, you at least want to start trading by a higher high and higher low. So technically on this day here, that would have been the setup. And then if you give it some wiggle room, you wouldn't have triggered in. You can see it retraced up. Now, on the day that it triggered, it triggered on the slide in here. And I was actually a little late to the game. I was super busy and I caught a red light on my way home from the gym. And I didn't catch it on the open. It triggered like right around the open. And I was actually a little late to the party, but I was still able to buy I was shorting, I shorted outright, I shorted it outright in my accounts that allow shorting. And then I bought a couple of puts in one of the accounts that does not, a qualified account. So we take a look at that. The entry was 106. The stop was 119. So that's like a crazy 13 points risk, but that's what the stock called for, okay? which gave us an IPT of 93. Now, by the way, little side lesson in here, if you're looking for 93, okay, and it goes all the way down to almost 95 intraday, don't split hairs, go ahead and lock and load on half of your shares. So we had, again, we had the bow tie, entry was here, stop up here, and IPT down here. Now, 13 points sounds like a lot. Well, it's only 13%, right? But look at this chart. It's just right there, okay? Look how close that is. That's that's probably, that's dangerously close to the entry. It could easily trigger an entry, bounce back, stop you out, and then roll over. So that's about as tight as I felt like we could go. I tried to get the stop, stop as tight as possible, but still allow enough room to hopefully ride out that short term noise so here's the the option trade i did on this and again i was a little late to the game so i forget exactly where it was i was trying to do the forensics today but i think the, the stock price was closer to was already it already dropped a couple of points from the entry but i, I quickly hurried up and got in so this was an in the money option. I paid 480 for that. And again, I don't know how much of that is fluff, but I think it was like a buck and a half of fluff when I got in the option and the rest of it was intrinsic. So do the math on that. Um, let's see, it was probably about 106 and I paid a buck and a half or even a buck 80 for intrinsic. And if you're trading an out the money option, you can put in a two times order at the limit just like I paid 25 cents and I flipped that half at 50 cents. When you're a little deeper in the money, it's a little harder to do that. But just for S and G's, I did put in a limit order at two times. And then when it got to 480 quickly, I had four points in this option that I just put on a couple hours earlier. I said, Dave, don't split hairs here. You were kind of, that that double was a bit of a pipe dream. So instead of getting a full double on that, I said, you know what, four points is enough, especially since it only took a couple of hours. So I took off one of those options and then I saved one to possibly, just in case the stock kept dropping. So I was almost at a free roll on the second option. And then I ended up getting out at a decent profit on that. So you can see this, just a couple of options here. And this is in the money options as a substitution for short. I am still short this stock in other accounts in non-qualified accounts, but, and I'm not saying rush out and start trading options in your IRA, but it's good to have that option. I have a client that never got around to filling out his options paperwork and I told him to do this 10 years ago. And every time the market begins to crash, he's like, what do I do? I can't, I can't buy put options. And I'm like, well, sign your paperwork, you know? 
So it does give you an option, no pun intended. Now, what about spreading? Well, I think you can get into a lot of trouble spreading. Spreading is when you, you buy one option, you sell another. And one thing that I've played around with a little bit, I did it today, I think I broke even on zero DTE options, is sometimes I'll do a ratio spread where you sell the inside and sell two times the outside, just one point out. And sometimes you can do that for a scratch and sometimes you can do it for a bit of a credit. But you end up, when you start building these complex option positions, you end up with too many moving parts. So the closest thing to a complex position that I will put on, never say never, but likely put on is a spread. But I'll admit, I'm really not good at this yet. I haven't wrapped my head fully around the spreads. Now, we have a, a new guy in a group, in a Facebook group that understands spreads. And I'm gonna have to spend some time wrapping my head around him and I'm looking forward to learning from him. And the good news is we're not starting from zero because I did learn a little bit through osmosis, like I said, from the 14 years I spent in the hedge fund. And they traded exclusively in, in spreads. And one thing I learned is you don't want to have unlimited losses, potential losses and limited gains. And that's a recipe for disaster. So we have a member of Facebook again, that's uh, knowledgeable, that should be knowledgeable. So I'm looking forward to learning from him and I might just cross over to the dark side a little bit once I can wrap my head around, spreads a little bit better. I still firmly believe in limited losses and the potential for our limited gains. That should be unlimited gains, that's what's wrong there. So make sure you're long two times or more the outside. So if you're gonna sell the inside, make sure you're buying a lot of the outside, at least two times the outside with the proceeds. Okay, so Asim was asking me about the KNF, KBH, and ELF, and then why I didn't take the PWR other than that little SNG trade. So we'll switch gears and get into the overall market and take a look at crypto. And I'll flesh that out a little bit. So let's just go ahead and shift gears. And if you guys want to start asking about individual stocks or crypto, feel free to do so now. So let's take a look at bow ties. And let's take a look at that PWR. So this was actually a pretty cool setup back here. And it really imploded from, nicely from that bow tie. The one thing that I didn't really like a lot about this setup was it just seemed to have a lot of support below now it wasn't cut and dry it wasn't like a big old fat huge base but you can see right here it's quite a bit of support okay if you start drawing your horizontal lines and then as you drop further and further there's more and more support so that's the only thing that i didn't like about it i may have liked it better up here where the support was quite a ways away but in general i try to avoid setups that are going to run into trouble fairly quickly now for a, a four-day option trade as a g type of thing i wasn't so so worried about that i was doing it more to kind of make a point point. and by the way um write this down if the 30 and 20 EMA and 10 EMA, the bow tie moving averages, if they sharply hit at a, a sharp inflection point, they drop sharply into the 50 simple and they cut right through it, those could be very powerful bow ties because that means that the market has changed direction very quickly and a lot of people are caught off guard. And the other thing that I, wanna, I wanted to uh, mention to Asim, is that you want to trade these transitional setups off of all time high. So that's PWR wasn't my favorite because of the potential support below. The KBH was coming off of all time highs, okay? And you can see it has a bow tie here. 
and it didn't have a lot of support for a long ways. Remember, we're trading up here at 50 bucks a share, and it doesn't have much support. It has a little support down here at 40, and then not a whole lot, and maybe a little bit at 35. But I figure if it got that far, it'd be a good problem to have. So that's why I like the KBH. Also, the home builders were also coming off of all time highs. And let me just show you them real quick. We'll get to them in a second, but I'll just pop them up real quick. So your home builders were also set up as sort of a bow tie and kind of a first thrust. So that kind of puts a little wind in your sails. And then what was the other one? KBH Elf. Uh, okay. So Elf kind of was defying gravity, even though the market was wouldn't the market top or the 20 uh, Okay. So this is kind of a last of the Mohicans type of situation where you've got this fairly sizable big cap stock. Uh, it's a well-known stock. I guess if you're a woman, it's even more well-known or a guy who wears makeup. But you can see that it did make a, a minor double top in here. It did have this sharp sell-off through the 50 simple moving average. You could argue it's a little choppy and it's not the most beautiful setup in the world. I'll, I'll give you that. But it did slice through all of this kind of this chop. It just dropped out of the chop, retraced a little bit. You've got the bow tie. You don't have a lot of support for quite quite a ways down, okay? And then the other thing I sort of thought about was that, okay, you've got this gap higher, and then you got 100% retrace on that. And so you probably had some people thinking that, oh, man, I missed that gap. Here's my chance. And it went back to brand new highs. OK, so you have to kind of think about it from a psychological standpoint. And so that double top is not just some sort of magical pattern that signifies the market is topped out, but it does kind of fake people out because notice it kind of exceeded the prior little peak. So anybody who bought on that dip or bought before the gap and held through the gap is breathing a sigh of relief. And then this thing rolls over in earnest. A lot of people are gonna wait for that market to rally to sell it, okay? And I was just, uh, I've been doing a series on Jesse Livermore and I think in chapter 20, 20 something, read the whole book once a year. But he does talk a lot about, if you kind of read between the lines, he talks a lot about how a stock will rally a little bit and that might be manipulation. They might push a stock higher so they can unload it. An institution might actually come in and buy a stock, push it higher, and then unload it. And a lot of people aren't gonna sell on the way up. They'll just keep holding and holding and holding and holding. And then when the pain of holding becomes too great, they start losing money, then they might dump it. And the other thing I liked about this one is, so it sets up right around here, okay? So now you've got all this overhead supply, all these people who bought anywhere above 112 round numbers, let's just say 110, is at a loss, okay? And they might, that's potential sellers, you know, push your short lower. ELF got an analyst upgrade just as the market dropped, okay? So the market topped on the 27th of July. So somewhere in there, ELF got an upgrade. And now, not so good. Short XBI along Lab D. Try to find XBI component to short. Nothing sticks out. Okay. Well, Biotech had a lower. Um, be careful you go long something like Lab D or any other leverage ETF, especially the short leverage ETFs, because you're going to have the what could be best described as a decay problem okay and all of those ETFs let me just show you real quick all of those ETFs eventually go to zero that's lab D it's been pretty impressive lately but let's take a look at a monthly monthly chart on that okay so lab D was twenty thousand dollars and now it's twenty six dollars okay take a look at sqqq so you could have made a half a million dollars, but you'd have had to put up a half a million dollars. Let's say you shorted a half a million dollars of SQQQ way back in 2010, 
and you covered somewhere down here, okay, at 20 bucks a share or whatever, you'd have made a half a million dollars by holding that short. I'm not suggesting you rush out and do that. And some of these are hard to short. Every now and then, though, you can short the SQQQ, and I've done that before. I've gotten burned a few times, too. All right, let me, let's uh, shift gears real quick, and let's take a look at crypto, and then we'll, if you have any stocks you guys want me to look at, I know we talk about stocks all day in Facebook, so we don't have too many lately, but if anybody's new to the group, or new to the webinar tonight, and just let me know. All right, let's see, let's get the... Trading view. I would prefer to short individual stocks, but I hear you, Keith, on something like biotech. Maybe you do want to, um, maybe you do want to short an index or something. So let's say a little crypto real quick. Here's what's got me excited. I'm kind of a closet bull on Bitcoin, okay, for various reasons. And one of those reasons would be if they get a cash ETF approved, I really think it would create a lot of demand. Now, of course, it could also create a lot of paper Bitcoin. And we had this conversation, I think, two weeks ago, and we've talked about it before. I think there's a lot of paper gold out there, for instance. There's only so much gold in the whole world in in one of you guys said it would fit in an Olympic size swimming pool. So for a lot of you guys, you could fit it in your backyard. All the girl, all the girl, all the gold in the world would fit in your backyard. And just with futures contracts and all these derivatives and options and all this other stuff, it makes you wonder how much why gold isn't so much high. And the same argument could be made for Bitcoin. But I do think that a cash ETF would certainly help it along. And we can take a look at GBTC in a minute. But Bitcoin is finally doing what I hoped it would do in a market slide. Now, there might be other reasons for this. But as a technician, I can just tell you it's mostly going up and the stock market is mostly going down. So we are getting some flight to safety, so to speak, in Bitcoin, which I think is a cool thing. Now, there's probably not, if you guys want to talk about any individual, anything else out there, let me know. Uh, we'll just go through a, a few real quick. That one looks like it's waking up. It's kind of thin. Like I said, when the markets, when the crypto is doing really well, you can just kind of come in here and buy the ones that are moving. But in general, you don't just want to do that. Ideally, you want to trade things that are set up. So any individual ones you guys want to look at real quick? All right, let's shift gears and go to stocks. So stocks are pretty ugly. How's that for an oxymoron from a trend following moron? So let's take a look at, let's start with the P's. S&P 500 got whacked pretty hard today, as you can see. Now it's not the end of the world. It's only, it's less than 1%, but we did stall out after kind of skirting that 30 EMA. And you have lots and lots of Landry light below that 50 simple moving average. And sometimes a longer longer period moving average and a simple moving average at that can kind of have a little lag in it, which is okay. So you kind of get a bigger picture look at what's going on. Okay, we're above the 50, lots of landing light, everything's pretty good. Now we're beginning to trade back and forth around it. Everything is not so good. And now we have a lot of landry lights to the downside. Let me see if we could show you that real quick and ACP. So let's change this EMA. Let's uh, switch screens here real quick. I'm getting fancy on you, so hopefully I don't get burnt. Okay, so let's, let's put in a, let's just do this. So let's, I have a template here somewhere. Let's do this, start from scratch. So I have a template for the zones. And I have a template for the, let's just use this template because I know I have a 50 simple moving average in here. So let's put in, let's put in Landry Light. 
okay? And this is 50, simple, okay, everything's cool here. So let's get rid of this. And then we'll get rid of this line here. So you can see, this is the weekly, we'll go to daily. But you can see, if you wanna look at things from a little bit bigger picture standpoint, something like your 50 simple moving average in Landry Light can keep you on the right side of the market. And then when you're getting upside and downside, upside and downside, you're like, aha, we're getting choppy in here. And then now you can see we've had 24 days of downside Landry Light. So that's a little bit more than a month worth of trading where the market has stayed below that 50 simple moving average. So hopefully that made sense. <laughs> so funny, if you know what I'm talking about, it's your eyes are glazing over. If you don't know, your eyes are glazing over. Uh, Bitcoin, like I said, it's been getting a bid. Bido, this is based on futures up a little today. GBTC up a little today. You can see we've got a little bit of a pop in here. This is on the news that the SEC is tired of fighting them. So we might see a cash Bitcoin and then Ethereum shortly thereafter. Getting back to stock, so NASDAQ sold off fairly hard today, down about a percent. You can see kind of bigger picture, head and shoulders top looking, kind of inverted cup of the handle looking, just kind of looking ugly in here. As usual, one day at a time, but not looking so hot. The Rusty is down here at multi-month lows, almost multi-year lows. What's scary in the Rusty is if we break this down decisively, you'd have a mountain of overhead supply and no support or meaningful support down into the pandemic low. So let's not think about that too much, but it is in the back of my head. One thing that's good, one slightly little tiny bit of good news is if you've been around for a while and you come in and it's like you see that bonds are getting creamed and they're down at brand new lows. I mean, look at this. Ugly, ugly. I was asked a couple of nights ago by somebody, what's going on with interest rates? I said, <laughs> they're going to go higher before they go lower. So bonds down, rates up. And bonds making brand new lows today with the vigor down 2%. Ugh, that's not a pretty thing. My wife's in the mortgage related business. She's a notary. So I'm not going to tell her. <laughs> not going to upset her. But it is good to see a little bit of buying in gold because that means that there is a little flight to safety and not all assets are being tossed out the window. And I'm pretty excited that Bitcoin is being bought up a little bit. And I hate to use the word hope, but hopefully that'll follow through. So as you go through most sectors, energy is notwithstanding. Energy is just of all time highs. Now, what's concerning about the energy though? is they still have a bit of a retrace potential double top look to them. I'm not gonna argue at all time highs, but I'm also not gonna take a mediocre setup at this juncture for two reasons. One, I'd like to see us bust out to new highs decisively and stay there for a while and then maybe have an orderly pullback. And two, I'm seeing a lot of shorts still setting up and the energies and some coal stocks, which usually follow suit with the energies. I'm actually seeing a short setup there. I have one in Landerless tonight. It's not an official setup, but I just showed, put it in a show everyone. one. So you could pretty much throw a dart at these sectors. And most of them are looking pretty ugly in here. There's foods. That's a pretty serious downtrend. You can see banks, pretty serious downtrend, although choppy. Financials have been pretty ugly in here. Look at that, banging out new lows. Lots of land light below the 50, proper order to the downside. It's ugly, okay? Take a look at drugs. They tried to make it back to their all-time highs, and they, they got thwarted, okay? Came right back in. Biotechnology, banging out some new lows in here. It's pretty much rolled over, as you can see. Or it's in a downtrend. Health services, that's a pretty serious downtrend. Fairly persistent downtrend at that. Defense, which you think would be doing really well, just retraced back up to this overhead supply. So all the wars going on in the world, I guess they're not, uh, I don't know, I don't wanna speculate, but for some reason, defense is not going up. It looks like it's still in trouble. 
So that might be the mother of all shorting opportunities, not to confuse the issue with facts, but when the market does the opposite of what it should be doing, that might be a time to consider shorting. Manufacturing, banging out new lows in here. M&C, of course, the home builders were short KVH, okay? Right off of these multi-month lows, that looks like a big, ugly top there. Just a few more. You get the idea. Transports, pretty serious slide remains in place. Semiconductors broke down a little today. They're kind of consolidating at these high levels, but they're beginning to make falling tops, and that's not a good thing, okay? Higher, I'm sorry, lower lows and lower highs, and that's the definition of a trend. Trend following one-on-one next to your net net price movement. Let's take a look at Q's real quick. Q's actually kind of hanging in there. I'm still long 100 shares of the Q's from the TFM 10% system from down around 319 and a half, I believe. And it's hard. It's getting hard to hold on, even though the system says not to sell just yet. But I never promised that I would follow a system mechanically. <laughs> All right. Any individual stocks you guys want to talk about? Going once, going twice. Well, actually, I want to thank all you guys and girls for attending. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. Maybe next time I'll have something more exciting than options to talk about. Uh, but you can also catch you can catch all the other shows on my website and on YouTube. At Dave Landry is my handle there. Everybody have a great weekend. To everyone who's here tonight, tonight uh, have a great weekend. But I'll talk to you again tomorrow. I'll see you in Facebook. So, again, everybody have a great weekend. And may the trend be with you. Thank you so much. You're welcome.